This is the second video for nitrous oxide, and we're going to be talking about the armamentarium for the use of nitrous oxide, oxygen inhalation, and sedation. So in dentistry, we use nitrous for conscious sedation, relative analgesia, inhalation, sedation, or the altered state of consciousness. We are um, particularly looking for the four A's, which we talked about in the last video, which are analgesia, anxiolytic, anesthesia and amnesia effects from nitrous oxide. But some fun facts as far as where um, nitrous is used in other instances. The food industry uses five to 8% of the nitrous manufactured in whipped cream propellant. So the ready whip that you put in your mouth, five to 8% of nitrous manufactured is used in whipped cream. Nitrous is used in the production of sodium azide, which is the explosive agent that inflates airbags. Nitrous is used to increase engine performance in racing. It's used in the silicone industry, oxidizes chemicals during manufacturing of computer chips. It's an oxidizer used in combination with fuel sources in hybrid rocket engines. So lots of different uses of nitrous oxide. It comes through, when we use it in the um, dental clinic, in the dental office, it comes through a controlled flow unit, which is hooked up to the tanks. The oxygen tanks are green, and you have to know this. The nitrous tanks are blue. There's no grease or lubricants that should be used on the valves because that could potentially be explosive. Um, we mentioned before that the green tanks are the oxygen, the blue tanks are the nitrous, and the oxygen tanks are filled to 2,000 PSI. They have an accurate pressure gauge, and the nitrous oxide tanks are filled to 750 PSI. When they're full, they're 95% liquid, 5% vapor. The gauge will not decrease until the tanks are about 20% full. We also mentioned before that nitrous oxide is made starting with ammonium nitrate. Crystals or liquid are heated to 250 degrees Celsius. Nitrous oxide, steam, or water and contaminants are produced. The gas is cleaned, dried, compressed, liquefied. It's stored in a blue tank as a liquid. And remember, we talked about that outside tank being very, very cold. Large cylinders, they have to be secured to the wall. There's copper tubing that runs between operatories or they have the portable units that use the E cylinders or the smaller cylinders like the green oxygen that we have at the end of the clinic. There's also a, another side that has a blue tank that sits next to that. Um, nitrous oxide is something that is kind of sought after, you know, people, um, there's been nitrous oxide abusers in the past, so we need to keep control and need to keep that locked up. You will see that the storm room will be locked when we're doing our nitrous oxide experiences because the nitrous has to be secured, it has to be secured to the wall and it has to be locked up. So there are valves placed directly on the cylinders that are turned on and off daily as needed. On portable systems, they are placed between the cylinders and, and the flow meters, so they're placed between. And then there's valves directly on them in the back room. So if I go to work and I'm gonna use nitrous, I need to go all the way to the closet in the back where the big tanks, big as I am, are kept, and I need to turn those on and off. Very important to turn those on or off because it, if you have a unit on somewhere in the office, then you can lose nitrous or oxygen just through that open valve, and um, it's very expensive. Pressure gauges are going to show the amount of nitrous or oxygen. Like I said, the oxygen is at 2,000 PSI, and it goes down gradually in increments as the oxygen is used. The nitrous is at 750, and it doesn't go down until the tank is about 20% full. So you really need to have somebody who's keeping track of ordering the oxygen and nitrous. You cannot use nitrous without also having oxygen. Here is, um, this is the exact flow meter that we have in the office where I work. There's a reservoir bag. 
that is on the, um, it's kind of inflate, it, it inflates like a balloon. And that's a bladder type bag made of silicone or rubber that attaches to the system at the base of the bag and above the emergency air valve. That emergency air valve provides the patient with atmospheric air should the unit stop functioning. Provides additional gas should the breathing demands of the patient needed, and it monitors respiration. You can see that bag, that balloon kind of going in and out, and it can be used to deliver 100% oxygen in the event of the, an emergency. There's a conduction tubing that connects the reservoir bag to the unit. You guys will be able to see this as you have your nitrous experience in clinic. There are full face masks, which obviously in dentistry we are not going to use. There's a nasal cannula that you see, you know, goes across the face and just into the nose. And we can't provide an adequate seal with that one for our patients and gas is escaping, so we're not gonna use that. That's more delivered for oxygen in a hospital situation. Um, it would help a claustrophobic patient when dental work is being done, but we really can't contain that gas so that nobody else is exposed. Most commonly in a dental setting, we're gonna use the nasal hood. The nasal hoods are scavenging, so they have tubes hooked to them and it has the, the nitrous going in and the nitrous going out or, or a flow across there. Two tubes, one delivers nitrous and one um, removes the exhaled air to the vacuum system. It also contains like a double nose piece where the smaller inside delivers the gas and the outer nose piece removes the exhaled gases. We have some that will be autoclavable they're kind of the rubbery and they're actually autoclavable. And then the ones that we use for you guys will give you a disposable one. You'll keep it while we're doing the nitrous experiences and then we'll dispose of that. There are some safety features um, that are on the nitrous oxide units and these are on all units. There's a pin index safety system. There's a minimum oxygen liter flow system. There's a minimum oxygen percentage system that's built in. Oxygen fail safe. If the oxygen level is low and falls below a certain level, nitrous is terminated. A patient will never receive 100% nitrous in this case. Infection control is really important. Um, let me see, let me go back for one second. To, we've got our pin index safety system. So, I want to talk about these just a little bit more because these are the safety mechanisms that you have to know for um, exam questions and for board questions. The pin index safety system prevents one from connecting the nitrous to the oxygen. So you have to put the nitrous on one side, you have to put the oxygen on the other correct side. This is so the patient can't accidentally receive 100% nitrous instead of 100% oxygen. They can't be reversed when replacing the tanks. The minimum oxygen liter flow, nitrous won't start till the minimum oxygen is flowing. And then the minimum oxygen percentage is having 30% oxygen at least being delivered. And then the oxygen fail safe is the nitri nitrous goes off if the oxygen is too low. So if your tank in the back is running out, it will just shut it all down. And I've had it before where I'm using it and all of a sudden the patient's not feeling it because it's went to 100% oxygen. And I've had to go in the back in the middle of a procedure, change the tank so that I now have the correct amount of oxygen so that the nitrous will start working again and then come back and finish the patient. Infection control, we wanna use disposable hoods whenever possible. And if not, if not disposable, wash it, um, autoclave it if you can. So our masks and hoses are autoclavable. You want to use disinfectant wipes. You want to use, um, you know, good soapy water. A lot of times these, um, our mask is autoclavable and our hoses are too, but some people will leave the hoses and the hoses sit across like a woman's face and they will have makeup on them. So, you, you know, I'll get those out and I'll wash those in soapy water and then I will send them back to be autoclaved because maybe the previous person didn't know, didn't think that it was a big deal for those to be autoclaved or not. But um, I want everything to be as 
disinfected, I was going to say sterilized, but sterilized, disinfected, sanitized, whatever the case may be, I want there to be no cross-contamination that happens because of the nitrous um, equipment. So one oxygen, one nitrous tank are opened. All equipment's checked for infection control. We want to make sure that we're taking um, disposable masks, autoclaved masks out and using them for that patient. All rubber goods are checked for leakage. There are some times where that balloon reservoir bag is um, dry rotted. It, I mean, over time it's going in and out. You're wiping it off with these chemicals. And there are times when um, it will just kind of dry rot and you'll hear some leaking, you'll hear some air leaks. So that reservoir bag, we keep that two thirds of the way full of oxygen and it allows the clinician to monitor respirations. As far as the patient goes, we need to review their medical history. We need to know their vital signs. We need to check their blood pressure, heart rate, their respiratory rate. And if the patient wears contacts, we ask them to remove them because there will be an airflow because the mask fits over the nose and sometimes it doesn't seal well. We're gonna position the patient according to their comfort level. Um, as far as medical history, we wanna make sure that they don't have any of the absolute contraindications, which would be COPD, cystic fibrosis. Um, we want to determine if they have an upper respiratory infection, if they will be able to breathe the um, nitrous oxide in. Position the patient, position the unit. So the unit is best when it's set behind the patient. Um, the units in the rooms where I work are permanently in the rooms and they're behind the patient. If it's portable, you still want it behind the patient and out of sight. Because if a patient sees the amount that they're getting, they may think it's too little. They may think that they don't feel it. And it doesn't take as much as you would think for them to feel because nitrous is an insoluble, relatively insoluble gas and it will go from the alveoli into the blood fairly quickly and um, you'll achieve nitrous oxide um, conscious sedation fairly quickly. You will start the flow of oxygen at six liters per minute. Place the nasal hood over the patient's nose and instruct the patient to breathe. You're gonna adjust the ring on the hose behind the headrest to kind of keep it secured on the patient. You're gonna check the scavenging tubes and be sure they're connected to the vacuum system so that the flow of inhaled um, or you know, inspiring nitrous oxide and exhaling um, breath is going out through the, through the hood properly. If the hood doesn't quite fit, you can put a little piece of gauze across the bridge of the nose to make sure that the fit is good on the mask. Most patients will be able to breathe comfortably at six liters per minute of oxygen. Begin children at four to five liters per minute of oxygen. Some patients might require higher volumes if they're exercisers or if they have pulmonary disease, if they may need more oxygen. You wanna make sure that the patient's not having any trouble breathing as they're um, having the oxygen started. So six liters of oxygen per minute. And then the bag's going to remain partially inflated and deflate with each breath. That's the adequate minute volume. A totally deflated bag, and you need to know these for test questions, totally deflated bag means that the minute volume is inadequate, that the hood could be leaking or the scavenging system is setting it too high and it's kind of sucking it through and kind of sucking that, that bag, um, all the oxygen or all the, the extra air out of that bag. If it's too inflated, then the minute volume is too high and those hoses could have a kink, so it's not getting through there, the flow is not going. So you want it to be partially inflated and deflate partially with each breath. When somebody tries to really breathe it in, you'll see that bag kind of stuck in and then expand. So you wanna make sure that they're breathing normally. Totally deflated bag means the minute volume that's flowing is inadequate and the scavenging system could be set too high. Or if it's too inflated, the hoses could have a kink and the volume set too, too high. Patients will complain about not having enough air or having too much air. And you're looking at the bag to make sure that there's that good um, in and out kind of pumping of the bag. 
So there's two techniques with titration of nitrous oxide. One is the constant leader flow, and one is the constant oxygen flow. So you're gonna begin titration. The nitrous and the oxygen in the constant leader flow technique, you're gonna move the nitrous and the oxygen. With the constant oxygen flow, you're gonna always have six liters of oxygen. So the constant leader flow technique. We're gonna establish the oxygen flow rate at six liters per minute. We're gonna increase the nitrous flow rate at one liter per minute, and we're gonna decrease the oxygen. So we increase the, the nitrous one liter per minute, and we decrease the oxygen. We started at five. We're gonna increase the nitrous at 0.5 liter minimum increments and decrease the oxygen until the proper level of sedation is achieved. So with the constant leader, we're adjusting both the oxygen and the nitrous. The oxygen's coming down, the nitrous is going up. So it uses a smaller volume of gas because you're turning the oxygen down and you're turning the nitrous up and you're titrating it for the patient based on what they need. So it's less co costly. Less nitrous is inhaled, so it's better for the office environment. Increments are fixed, and it is possible to over sedate a patient. If you turned the oxygen down and the nitrous up, you could over sedate a patient. You could get them from the stage one anal, general anesthesia that we would like, or the stage of, anal, stage of anesthesia that we would like, stage one, you could have them slip into stage two, which is delirium, and we don't want that. So here's kind of that flow. You start off at six liters of oxygen, zero nitrous, then we go down to five, up to 16, and I'll, I'll tell you the figures in just a minute. Um, down to 4.5, up to 25% of, of nitrous down to four, up to 33% of nitrous. This is the constant leader flow. This is the first one. This is the one where we're adjusting both. Then we've got the constant flow technique. We're establishing the oxygen flow at a rate of six liters per minute. We're increasing the nitrous one liter per minute. Oxygen is remaining the same. So the oxygen's at six, the nitrous is at one. We're increasing the flow rate in increments of 0.5 to 1 liter per minute until the proper level of sedation is achieved. So for this, it's easier to use because there's only one dial. A larger volume of gas is delivered, so the patient's not going to have any trouble breathing because it's more gas. Over sedation is less likely because that oxygen is staying up at 6 in the constant oxygen flow technique. Large volumes of gas can make it more costly and greater amounts of nitrous are released into the environment. So the first one, we kind of had the opposite. The first one, when we're having our discussion, it's using smaller volumes of gas, less costly, less nitrous is inhaled, so better for the office environment increments are fixed and the biggest um, downfall to the first one constant leader flow where we're adjusting both of them at the same time is it's possible to over sedate and for the constant flow technique constant oxygen flow technique or cons yes constant oxygen flow technique this one star 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 easier to use one dial Larger volume of gas is delivered. Over sedation is less likely. Large volumes of gas make it more costly and greater amounts of nitrous are released into the environment. And here's where this one stays at six, all the way down, six liters of oxygen, one dial. Percentage goes up as we change and go up from one to two liters per minute to three to four. 
determining the percentage of nitrous oxide gas used. So the percentage of nitrous used, we have to put the liters per minute of nitrous and then we add the oxygen and nitrous divide by those added together. So if we had two liters of nitrous that we were delivering and we had two liters of oxygen and two liters of nitrous, that's four, two over four, so 50%. So if the float ball's on three for nitrous and three for oxygen, what's the percentage of nitrous gas? Three liters of nitrous, six liters of gas, three plus three, so one half, which is 50%. So similar to the one that I just um, had mentioned. So 70% of the patients are going to achieve adequate sedation of nitrous with percentages of 30 to 40% nitrous. Observe the patient for signs and symptoms of sedation. They're going to tell you that they don't feel it and you're going to see actions that they are um, you know, exhibiting that would make you think that they are feeling it. So early to ideal are phase one sedation. They're gonna feel a little dizzy, tingling of the hands and feet. They're gonna feel a little warm, a little bit of vibrating, a little numbness of their hands and feet, a little numbness of their cheeks. Um, they'll be kind of laughing, you know, they call it laughing gas. Some people really laugh. It's really funny when we're in clinic and we're seeing how it affects, you know, some of our quietest students can be just the most giggly people when they get on nitrous. And then sometimes it's the opposite effect for some of our louder, um, you know, maybe funnier or, or you know, more um, outgoing students will be really quiet and reserved on nitrous. When we're in that heavier sedation, going into that stage two where there's delirium, hearing becomes more acute, visual images are kind of confused, blurry, they're really sleepy, sweating, laughing or crying, you know, kind of hysterically, um, and nausea. Nausea is a, a good sign of over sedation. That will be something that people complain of is the nausea, you know, and even vomiting if they are, um, if they get too much nitrous oxide. Don't leave the patient alone. You've got to monitor them. You don't want them to slip into that stage two, which is delirium. You want to keep them in that stage one. And if you see that they're, you know, getting a little bit um, more sleepy and you can, you'll be able to tell. And when we get into clinic, you'll see what I mean. You will be able to tell when the patient starts getting a little bit more and you can turn it down. You're, you're, using that volume and you're changing the liters of nitrous to oxygen based on your patient, based on them feeling enough of an altered state of consciousness to be able to um, take that anxiety, take that edge off. You are going to begin treatment and you're gonna to continue to observe them and make adjustments. Sometimes once you get going and they start to relax anyways, you can turn that nitrous down a little bit. At the completion of the procedure, you terminate the flow. You don't titrate it out, you just turn it to 100% oxygen. You turn the oxygen to the original flow rate, so with the one where you've turned the oxygen down and the nitrous up, you put the oxygen back up, nitrous goes down. The patient will breathe 100% oxygen for not less than three to five minutes. The nitrate, nit nitrous oxide is not titrated out of the patient, so you just turn 100% oxygen on right away. Um, discharging patient, the blood pressure should be pretty close to where you started. Heart rate should be pretty close to where you started and respirations should be pretty close to where you started within three breaths per minute, 15 beats per minute, and you know 10 to 20 um, millimeters of mercury for the blood pressure. So parameters could vary a little bit from those guidelines and be normal, but you want to make sure and monitor them and make sure that they're okay to go, just like with anesthesia when you sit somebody up. If a patient feels lightheaded when they stand up, have them sit back down and have put the oxygen back on for a couple more minutes. The Trigger test. This is a test where you actually ask the patient to join some dots, and this will determine if they are ready to go. They um, connect a series of dots 
and this will determine if the um, nitrous is out and they are ready to go. So it's the Trigger test and you should know that. Does the patient feel normal? If so, then you can discharge them. A lot of the times they will try to tell you they're normal and they'll kind of stagger a little bit, have them sit back down and go ahead and put the, nit or put the oxygen back on. Following the administration of nitrous, they may feel a little excess gas in the stomach or excess ear pressure. This is why nitrous is a relative contraindication to somebody with bowel troubles or middle ear troubles. It's important that you explain those risks prior to them getting nitrous. Benefit outweighing the risk kind of thing. So you're always going to record it in the record and you're gonna disinfect the equipment. Hopefully most of the stuff will be autoclavable. You really wanna be cautious of an office that doesn't autoclave stuff that's supposed to be autoclaved. Infection control is huge. So potential complications are rare with nitrous, but when they do occur, it's because the concentrations are above that 50% and they've had the nitrous on for a long time. So if you're doing a long procedure, you wouldn't want, if you're doing a two and a half hour, you know, half mouth scaling and root planing, you wouldn't want to have nitrous concentrations high for um, a long duration. Nausea and vomiting are the, probably one of the more common things that we see as a result of over sedation or low oxygen. Could be possibly due to food in their stomach or an empty stomach. So ideally they would eat a couple hours before the appointment. Kind of feels like, it sometimes feels like they could be on a roller coaster ride. Patients will describe that as their feeling. So if um, you're titrating it and they are, they're breathing it in and they start talking. They shouldn't be talking. As they're talking, nitrous is being released. So you want to make sure they're not talking. You want to make sure that they're breathing normally, not breathing a lot in. Because if they're breathing a lot in, they get a big boost of nitrous and then they breathe regular. So it can kind of go up and down and that can make somebody feel nauseous. Monitor the patient. You're not going to have left them alone anyways. The patient is going to have some warning signs. They're going to feel like they, they kind of feel sick. They're going to want to remove the hood and kind of just get a little agitated. Um, you would put the oxygen on, turn the nitrous off, put the oxygen on, and you know try to get something to them that they could throw up into if that was the case or vomit into. Um, nitrous can displace air in the maxillary sinus, can give somebody a feeling of toothache. So that's another, if they complained of, you know, a toothache kind of feeling, that could be a side effect of nitrous. Vertigo, prolonged exposure to nitrous can precipitate an episode of vertigo. So patients can also complain of just kind of feeling a little off balance or a little bit hearing um, impairment. Air spaces in the bowel can be displaced by nitrous and they can, there can be some bloating that's caused from the nitrous gas. And claustrophobia is a relative contraindication. It's a, it's a real fear and we need to make sure with the nasal hood and the scavenging system that we don't have our claustrophobic patients have even more of a feeling of claustrophobia. We mentioned before contact lens wearers, we, want to have them take their contacts out prior to us giving nitrous. And another relative contraindication is the enlarged tonsils or adenoids that can provide an obstacle for nitrous due to airway obstruction, deviated septum as well. Language barrier, you wanna make sure that the patient knows what you're doing. Um, you want to be able to call the translation service and have the patient agree to the nitrous oxide. and potential biohazards to long-term exposures. There are um, potentials for miscarriage for a dental hygienist or assistant who, was, who is working around nitrous. When I was pregnant, I, I won't say I refused, I just didn't work around nitrous oxide. And my boss would get somebody else to come in if, if the patient needed nitrous or if, if a hygiene patient, because I was doing assisting and hygiene, if a hygiene patient needed nitrous, they would have that hygiene patient go with another hygienist, somebody who wasn't pregnant, because the enzyme 
um, there it could cause a miscarriage. Nitrous oxide exposure over a pregnancy could cause a miscarriage. So it's better benefit outweighing the risk. There's a risk, so um, no benefit. So try to avoid it at all, at all possible. There is an enzyme um, that is inactivated by nitrous that is linked to vitamin B12. And um, chronic exposure to nitrous can affect B12 metabolism. B12 is responsible for DNA production and cell reproduction. So chronic exposure to nitrous can affect B12 metabolism. And B12, remember, is um, malabsorption of B12 leads to pernicious anemia and megoblastic anemia. So megoblastic hemopiosis and leukopenia can result after prolonged exposure. And high concentrations of nitrous or long exposure times can affect reproduction, so the miscarriage and reproduction in general. Um, pregnancy, they, they, it's undecided, but benefit outweighing the risk, too much risk. Postponement of nitrous for patients in their first trimester of pregnancy. Other trimesters, you could consult with their MD, their OBGYN. Office personnel that are pregnant may want to consider limiting exposure to nitrous in the office environment. Um, megoblastic anemia occurred in the 50s when nitrous was used to treat tetanus. Um, there's not really any recent cases, but that has to do with the B12 deficiency. Neurological disorders have occurred with chronic abuse and neuropathies with chronic abuse. Need to have scavenging methods in place so that you can have the nitrous removed from the area and detection and monitoring of nitrous oxide. You need to keep the patient and personnel informed. So if somebody was pregnant in the area and you were using it, you'd wanna let them know that you were using it and keep, um, you know, at least give them the opportunity to leave the area if they wished. Other things here. One thing that I did want to mention is, um, there we go, sorry, got to put my papers here. Um, there is a high rate of abuse among healthcare providers. Um, when I first got into dentistry, there was often times where you would feel you would hear about a dentist who, after patients left, was maybe found hooked up to nitrous and had passed away from nitrous. I mean, there was some real abuse issues. Um, so it is there is a high rate of abuse among healthcare providers. Um, let's see. There are a lot of medical emergency questions asked on the exam. So highly concentrated on medical emergencies and what nitrous does to the body. So knowing things like the normal blood pressure, 120 over 80, normal pulse, 60 to 100 beats per minute for an adult, normal respirations, 12 to 20 per minute for adult. Um, the typical volume, Tidal volume in an adult is six to eight liters per minute. In a child, it's four to six. Um, effects of nitrous on cardio, there's not much effect on cardio patients. Evaluate carefully, consult with physician. Depresses the CNS. Um, effects of nitrous on vitals under minimal sedation, vital signs are only slightly depressed. So heart rate and blood pressure are only slightly depressed on um, nitrous with minimal amounts. So that's a good thing. Nitrous is absorbed. It's not metabolized. It crosses through the lungs to the blood, remains unchanged. If a patient becomes restless during nitrous, you should reduce the nitrous by 5%. 
or you know in increments by five percent or turn it to 100 percent oxygen nitrous is mostly excreted through the lungs 99 percent is excreted through the lungs the other is in the GI tract. The other is metabolized in the GI tract. Um, an interesting thing is at altitude, there is a higher concentration of nitrous to obtain the same sea level effect. So in Denver, which is 5280, mile high city, right? 5% more increase in nitrous to get the same effect. So at altitude, the higher concentration of nitrous to obtain the same um, levels. If the patient becomes nauseated, we're going to give 100% oxygen for five minutes. We're going to document vitals, record incident in chart. What is titration and how to achieve it? Titration of the nitrous and oxygen is going to be different for every patient. It's biological variability of how that um, insoluble gas pressure goes into the blood and how much it takes for that patient. Remember that um, a male larger might take a little bit more than a smaller female, you know, adjust by five to 10%. So 0.5 or one liter until patient is comfortable. We would want that patient, and we as hygienists cannot give over 50% nitrous. Remember your ASA codes. So for your ASA one, normal healthy patient, two mild systemic disease, three severe systemic, you need to know those ASAs because they will ask about those on your nitrous exam. Um, over sedation of a patient, they may become angry, they may feel really heavy, may feel like they're flying, spinning, nauseous, unable to keep their mouth open, laughing hysterically, that would be over sedation. Some of the complications could be swelling, or swelling, sweating, <laughs> not swelling, um, sweating, kind of a pale skin color, decrease in their blood pressure, increase in their heart rate, you would terminate nitrous. And don't forget from our last video, we talked about the concentration of atmospheric air, that it's 79% nitrogen, 20.9% oxygen, 0.04% carbon dioxide, and the respiratory system exchanges carbon dioxide and oxygen across capillary membranes normally. So don't forget your normal um, numbers, your normal vitals. Definitely your diaphragm contracting, moving down, creating a negative pressure and then your external intercostal muscles lifting your ribs up and out, chest expands, so on your inhale and your exhale. And when you are talking about just the, um, the structures, the respiratory structures in general, You've got your pharynx, which is your throat, passageway for food traveling from the oral cavity to the esophagus. You have your nasopharynx, your oropharynx, your laryngopharynx, and in that order. So remember that order. The larynx is below that, enlargement of the airway at the top of the trachea, below the pharynx, houses the vocal cords. Epiglottis covers the opening of the larynx during swallowing, preventing food and liquids from entering air passages. Then you've got your trachea, anterior to the esophagus, extends into the thoracic cavity or the chest, splits into the left and right bronchial tree. The bronchial tree, here's a kind of a key thing, bronchial tree on the right side, there's minimal divergence. So there's only like a 25 degree divergence on the right side of the bronchial tree going to the lungs. Most aspirated objects from the trachea go into the right bronchi because of that slight 25 degree divergence from the trachea. So commonly, if something gets aspirated, it goes into the right lung. The left lung is twice as long, 
smaller in diameter, the bronchial tree is smaller in diameter to get there with a 45 degree deviation from the trachea. So typically any um, aspirated objects go into the right because there's not much of a turn to get there and it's a little bit bigger of an opening to go to the right. The left is longer and smaller in diameter and 45 degree deviation from the trachea. And then the alveoli are the air sacs where the gas exchange takes place in the lungs. And remember about the pressure um, in the alveoli pushing, you know, the higher nitrous pressure, pushing it into the bloodstream fairly quickly with the insoluble um, gas that nitrous is. Stages of anesthesia, you really need to know those. You need to know that nitrous oxide is a depressant. If you use it with other depressants, it can potentiate the effect. Um, sedation, amnesia, analgesia, mild anesthesia, anesthesia and anxiety relief. The minimum alveolar concentration needed for sedation using nitrous is 104 to 105%. That's a measure of the drug's potency. Nitrous oxide is a low potency medication. Nitrous oxide is insoluble in blood. Nitrous is not metabolized in the body. And nitrous oxide is the least potent of all inhaled gases used in healthcare. Nitrous is stored as a liquid in that blue steel cylinder. Oxygen is stored as a gas in that green steel cylinder. Newer tanks are made of um, aluminum. They should be stored upright. And remember we talked about the FDA regulating nitrous oxide, the DOT being um, participants in getting the gases to the facility. So those are important regulatory agents that um, have to do with the um, our use in getting the regulating the transport of the gas. DOT overseeing the transport, FDA regulating the nitrous industry. I'm trying to make sure that I didn't miss anything else. Oh, here's one more. So the ADA recommendation for trace levels of nitrous in the dental office should not exceed. Let me see here. I've got a test question on this. You guys should really be interested in that. The right number. All right, so two different two different numbers. The ADA recommendation for trace levels of nitrous in the dental office should not exceed 50 parts per million. FDA regulates nitrous oxide as a drug. Nitrous oxide is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, FDA. Michigan Department of Transportation, so MDOT regulates the packaging and transfer of gas tanks. Um, what are the current recommendations for the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSHA, for acceptable parts per million for nitrous oxide in the ambient air for personnel in the dental setting? 25 parts per million during administration. 50 parts per million for trace levels in the dental office, but 25 parts per million during administration. So those are important to know as well. The most chronic, um, most severe result of chronic nitrous abuse is bone marrow suppression. And we will talk about a lot more of these when we're in class. And I know that a lot of people like to just listen and have me repeat this stuff to them. So these are all really important little fun facts. Um, lots of stuff in the nitrous, so don't take the nitrous exam lightly. A lot of people think that because it's a shorter unit, 
it is easier and they are often surprised with the nitrous exam. There's a lot of questions about medical emergencies, those relative and absolute contraindications that we talked about in the first video. So, um, dosimetry badges are also available for detection and monitoring. So monitoring the, ga the gas similar to the x-ray badges. And we've really got to talk about the benefit and risk and get informed consent from the patient. You want to make sure you've went over their medical history well and what they're going to feel. You want to tell them, you know, they're, they're going to feel that um, tingling in their fingers. They're going to feel a little dizziness, a little numbness. Um, they may laugh. They may get a headache and, you know, are nauseous. So we want to make sure that they have all of the information. And then here's for dental operatories. It's 50 parts per million by NIOSHA and 25 parts per million for ambient air. All right, great job guys.